John, welcome to the podcast. Glad to have you, man. I'm looking forward to this, my friend. Yeah, I've been excited to chat with you for a little while. Uh, really interested in your journey, just in the stuff obviously you're doing, you know, I'm a father and just the stuff you're doing around that whole community. Um, so, you know, being the Just Get Started po podcast, I thought I'd maybe try to go down one or two lanes today and stay focused on a few areas, but knowing we'll go off probably on some tangents, we'll just let that fly if it does. I can almost assure you I'll take us off path. <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to start with, um, because I was, I'm curious, you know, we can look back, I, it was, you know, 2005, it seemed when you started your, your the, the first business with this, the, the, the front row uh, global, but I'm curious with getting started moments, you know, sometimes it doesn't happen like that, right? It takes a few years or sure. ideating, all this stuff goes on. So can you share with everyone, what did the early 2000s look like? What was your life at that time? Were you yep. pondering this idea for a while? Like where were sure. things going? And then we'll kind of get to the point of inflection when that actually happened. Yeah, you know, I think that you're right, man. It's, you can certainly see that there are more standout moments that could exist in your life where like, that was significant and either both joyful or tragic. That was the time I got into a car accident. That was the time I got diagnosed with cancer. That was the time I got a divorce. Mm -hmm. But there's also like, that's the time I had a kid. That's the time I said yes to this big trip where I went to this big life-changing personal growth event or I found mm -hmm. this person's podcast, whatever. There's all these moments that could arguably be given some um, value as to the impact that they might've had in our lives. And, and when I look back and I try to connect all the dots, what I can see that was happening in the in the early 2000s is I was figuring out that I was figuring out who I was, what I was good at, what my strengths were, and then I was figuring out how to apply them in the world. And then I was I was at times having the courage to say yes to those missions, yes to those adventures, you know, saying no to the things that weren't lighting me up anymore. So professionally, you know, I was in this job where I was a, I was an employee of a company. My job was to host live events, create incentives that motivated salespeople, take them on trips. It was literally like my dream job. Yeah. And when I think about who I was as a little kid, Brian, like I was the kid that at, at moments, I mean, I was lots of versions of a kid, but one of them was, you know, my parents would be sleeping. I'm up early and I like organize the living room and make menus and make them breakfast because I craved somebody telling me I was a good kid. I, I would do anything to light someone up and make them feel good. I see that in my son, Ocean, right now, who's seven years old. I'll come home from a trip and he'll have made this little snack for me and a special drink and he puts it at the front door when I walk in and it says, welcome home, Papa. And, um, you know, and, and, and I see that in him. He's doing the same thing. People come over to our house and he walks up to an adult and says, hey, can I get you something to drink? And they're like, they tap him on his head. You're such a good little kid. Yeah. You're so, he's being, he found a way to push the lever that's releasing the dopamine and the endorphins and the serotonin, like all the chemicals, the good chemicals have been, yeah. have been released enough in his body. Well, that was me, man. All through my life, I was, I was building to this point where what I wanted to do was make people smile. I, I wanted to find as many ways to do that as possible. It was like an insatiable appetite for wanting for people to say, you're a good guy, John. Like yeah. you're, you're enough, you, you can be loved now, right? So all the things, starting the charity Front Row Foundation, which helps people who have a life-threatening illness to go to the live event of their dreams. Uh, that was all part of this insatiable appetite for wanting to like be a moment maker for other people. And it was just little things here, little things there. I just kept seeing the, the writing on the wall was like, this is what I was supposed to do. Be a moment maker. That was an identity that I was forming. You know, back in the early 2000s, you know, entrepreneurship nowadays, every, you know, it's kind of the, it's a, it's a hot thing, if you will, you know, last, you know, half a dozen, dozen years. But back then, obviously you had the dot-com era and all that, but did you always think about like, starting your own foundation and business and running that? Or was it always the mind of, I'm going to work for, you know, work for someone? Because you and I are probably similar ages. I'm, I'm 39. Um, from the fact of growing up in like the 90s, again, the early 2000s, going to college and stuff, it was always that idea of go get an entry-level job, go work your way up, have a, have, a, sure. have a good life, you know, that type of thing. And then thought never occurred to me until probably, you know, a dozen years ago of like, wait a minute, I can create my own life that makes me happy and stuff like that. If I really want, if that's the path I want to go down, you know, yeah. 
I, I don't know if you so went when to I the was, same. When I was 17, I worked as a waiter at the officers club. My dad was in the Navy. He was a captain. We're up in Pennsylvania, Harrisburg to be specific. And I worked at this O club, the officers club. And I actually loved that job being a waiter. I loved, you know, it was great. Great first job, right? Got a chance to talk with people. Then I, at 18, I found Cutco Knives. And Cutco, like these high-end kitchen yeah. knives that you'd sell to people in their homes. I mean, these are $1,000, $2,000 sets of knives, right. right? And in 45 minutes, you're hopefully selling one of these sets of knives and then getting referrals to their friends to go sell more knives. That's a really challenging job. Right. And I found that job. And um, you know, that was my first taste at being a person who set his own schedule. So I had this presented to me. Like, hey, you can control your schedule. These are the benefits of doing that. That was my first exposure to that world. Well, I ended up staying with that company. That's I was an employee of that company. That's the one I was just talking about. I was with yeah. them for 14 years. Oh, wow. The job that all my friends laughed at me for getting and telling me it was a total scam turned out to be a really legit company, beautiful company, privately owned, doing hundreds of millions of dollars of sales, really great training program. So I was exposed to that world early on. Then there was a moment when I got offered a job and I'm like, dude, being an entrepreneur is really hard. <laughs> and I was like, you're going to pay me six figures and I get to like go home at night and, and literally turn off work in some ways, you know, have a, a more relaxed schedule. Yeah. I loved that for eight years. I was an employee, mm -hmm. but then after a while I had, I had done, I'd run that route, right? I'd hit the, the position that I was not going to promote myself out of. And then I realized I need to go back out and do it on my own again. Like ultimately in the end, I want to own my life. I want to own my schedule. I don't want to work for anybody. And that was more of a clarity of, of like, I don't want to be controlled. I don't want somebody to tell me how I'm supposed to think, how I'm supposed to act, how I'm supposed to operate. Like I felt the brewing autonomy within me and I knew I needed to go do something about it. Well, and that's what I was curious about, because th this comes up a lot in conversations I have with folks that, you know, they're working a full-time job, but they're not building anything on the side, but they kind of want to, you know, they'll share ideas or oh, I'd love totally. to do this or that. And it could be as simple as they want to put a garden in their backyard. And it's like, yeah, I don't have the time. I'm... Were there any things from your experience that you remember that were, you know, maybe is helpful to kind of get started and, and move the move the needle just a little bit um, mm -hmm. forward? Well, I think the answer to me for everything in life is get around people who are doing what you want to do. I know that's a platitude, you know, to offer that up because it's like what you, I mean, if I hear one more person quote Jim Rohn's, you know, you're the average of the five people that you surround yourself with. But the reason they quote it is because it's true, right? Yeah. It's like, that's why we do that. I mean, I've said that in a number, I'm saying it now, I'm telling you that yeah. that has been the answer for me in almost everything when it comes to fatherhood or marriage or business or anything I wanted to do and do well. It's what I help my kids to do. Oh, you want to go learn jujitsu? Let's find the best jujitsu studio. Let's find the best coach. Let's find the best place for you. What's the environment where you can thrive? Oh, my son's in theater. He's an actor now. He wants to dance and sing. And so we've got him in. He literally right now as we're speaking, he's in a camp right? Surrounded by people who want to nurture that. To me, that's it, man. It's you got to find the community and step into that space and you can't help but be affected by that. I mean, okay, so I have a buddy come over this morning. He's a front row dad, great guy named David, has a 10-year-old son. He stops over 7.30 a.m. We're going to sauna and cold plunge and do the whole coffee, sit on the porch. And I'm sitting there on our porch. We have this, we just moved into this new house about seven months ago. And I, he's like, what's the biggest win in your life? I'm like this, you're looking at it, like the house, the environment. And I, I looked over, and I said, here's what's fascinating, man, is I'm, I'm so passionate about shaping environments that create behaviors for my own life, literally, personally, but as a dad, as a husband, what, how can I shape the environment? Well, I looked over, I said, that ping pong table, when that ping pong table was pushed eight feet towards the other wall, it was somewhat inconvenient. We were trying to get it out of the way when we weren't using it right. and it was eight feet against the wall. Nobody ever played it ever for seven months. Nobody played it. I pulled that ping pong table out seven feet, basically putting it directly in the path of traffic. It has been played every single night for the last 30 days, wow. every single night, yeah. every single night we play the ping pong, you know, play ping pong. And 
dude, I think that's the thing that for anything we want to create in our life, it is shape the environment, find the people, shape the environment, find the people. And that is the, that is the step. That is the place to go because then this is the Dan Sullivan, who not how philosophy, right? It's like, not how do I get there, but like, who, who do you connect with? Who do you hire? Who do you surround yourself with? Who do you align with? Yeah. That's you the know, impetus I, of it all. Well, I, I like the point and, I, and you know, the kind of the word I underscored here is find. They're not just going to magically come to you and, you know, you, you have to go out and, and somehow seek. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm thinking about this because I'm, I'm, as we're recording this right in early June, I'm going to a conference in New York called, called Next Gen Summit. And it was a group, I, again, serendipity, you know, this probably from podcasts and other stuff. I, I met one of the co-founders of it, it was on the podcast and he's like, Hey, you should come up to this event. It was like their third year of the summit. This is in 2019 pre-pandemic. It was the most life-changing event of all time. All these young entrepreneurs. I met my men, one of my mentors I have now, I met him. Um, I met a few other folks there that are good friends, but it was one of these things where I wasn't going to go initially. And I was like, yeah, maybe I'll go. Like, who knows it's going to be. It was an unbelievable event. And I'm sure you can experience what the events you guys put on, right? It's like all of a sudden now I have these community members, these people that I'm a, a part of that are intertwined in my life for the rest of my life, all because I stepped out of my comfort zone and said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go to this thing. Yeah. And, you know, I, because I knew I wanted to surround myself with different people than that were in my life. Not that all were bad. I had a lot of good people, but different people yeah. kind of aligning toward my North star, you know? Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent, man. And, you know, look, my son, Tiger, my older son is, uh, um, you know, his birthday's coming up in a couple of weeks. And I sent a message out to is it 13 guys, 14 guys. I think I padded it with one, but I was like, guys, you're, 14 of the most important people in my son's life, would you all write a letter to him for his birthday? Mm. And so I'm, I've just got my first letter from my, one of my best friends, Hal Elrod, who wrote a book called the miracle morning. And mm. you know, I'm looking at it right now. It's on my computer. And I think about yeah, like also helping if you're a parent out there, putting your kids in the way of great men and women and leaders. Right. And here it is, man, like this beautiful letter from Hal. What an honor it is to be writing you this letter, he writes. I remember when your dad called me and told me that your mom was pregnant with you. He was so excited to be a dad. And then he just goes on and on, right? Here's mm -hmm. some of the things I've learned about life. Always give your best at everything you do. Focus on helping others and adding value. Be grateful for everything and every moment. Uh, fitting for our show today. But there it is, man. It's, it's um, what are all the different ways that we can build bridges, make connections? Yeah. Yeah, that's well, that's the whole that's the key to life, man. It's well, I, th I think the uh, you made another good point. I, I just want to make sure we underscored about the environment. And, and it got me thinking, you know, I, I look at this from fitness always. I know you, you've done ultra marathons and stuff, right? Is that right? I did, but not competitively, no. like more okay. so to punish myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, even, but even though to prepare for those, like, I, I, again, another example, like, you know, I'm, I'm big into CrossFit, been doing it about four and a half years. And it's been really important for me. Yeah. But when I moved into my new house a little over a year ago, it was really important for me to put a whole, like the rogue, um, you know, whatever system, if you call it. So like the, the I have barbells, I have all this stuff in my house yeah. because I knew I I knew I couldn't always get there um, sure. to the CrossFit gym, but again, I wanted to create an environment where it was easy for me to go work out. And it, then, it, the, you know, cause the excuse comes in when those things aren't there. It's like, well, I can't make it today. I'll go tomorrow. At least I can say, well, I can walk downstairs, Brian, you know? So I think that, that creating the environment, putting, you know, this is the same too. I've talked with a lot of folks about, you know, the health and wellness. Like it's like, well, I can't stop eating like this food or that food. Well, is it in your pantry? Like take it out of your pantry. You know, like, take the cookies out of the pantry and put in some good stuff. And maybe the snacking won't be there. I, yeah, it's simple. Totally. Things like that, That's like you know? parents are like, well, I'm a kid. will only eat blank. I'm like, well, how did the kid get a hold of blank? <laughs> right. right. A kid will only eat French fries or cheeseburgers. I'm like, and where are they getting access to those? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just one of those things. Like if you, if you put the, the barriers in the way, yeah. it's going to be hard to do things and, and vice versa. If you may, I think this is all part of like James clear with the atomic habits, you know, sure. make it this, make, make it easy, you know, make it achievable, yeah. stuff like that. Right. Do you invite people over to work out with you? Um, I, 
have invited some folks. They they have not taken me up on it, but uh, (laughs) that's the best to me. Like, you know, so when we bought this sauna and this cold plunge for the back, I, I, I was, I couldn't wait to have people over to, to do that with them. Right. Like I imagined the conversations that we would be having and the experiences that we would be having. And um, so far that's turned out to be really, that's true. That has been (laughs) build the sauna and they will, they will come. <laughs> well, I like that. Yeah. Expect, it, well, that, uh, again, you become that, Hey, this is the place we're going to hang out and, and enjoy yeah. and, and build memories. I will say though, with my son, it is nice to have that because I will have him work out with me, you know, I have him do some kettlebell deadlifts. I'll have him do yeah. some, some rowing he likes to do. So like having those things, I think is important. Again, we'll go on walks and go to the, you know, in nature, yeah. but it's kind of cool to also see our right, dad does this, Dude, totally. you know, so I think that's kind of neat as well. Um, Absolutely, man. Oh, you know what? This may be a good transition. Uh, maybe it's not. Who knows? But I, I, obviously, front front row global, you know, 05, like, hey, let's get that going and move it. Why was it so important? Now, my assumption is because you were a dad, but why was it so important for front row dads to exist and to start that venture? When did yeah. that idea pop up? And, and why was that kind of the yeah, the push forward. So here's here's what happened, right? So I'm, and this is actually an important part of the story. If I go all the way back to my 20s, I start conditioning myself to work hard. I condition myself to make sacrifices, to prioritize, put my best work in the most you know most energizing hours of the day, and so on and so forth. All of a sudden, you have kids, and there's all sorts of things going on in your life. One. They're like, oh man, I, I really need to succeed because there's this child that needs me, right? I'm a, I'm a dad. I need, it's more than just me. I can risk a lot when it's me, but maybe I risk less when it's this little life on the line. So there's a pressure to perform. Also, when, the, when, when, we, got, when we had our first tiger, Tatiana's the one nursing and taking care of the child most of the time. And you know, I'm taking care of her and I'm snuggling the baby. Of course, I'm snuggling tiger, but, but you know, I'm, I'm still working. And, you know, we've talked about this a lot. Men don't ha- necessarily have a, there's not even a natural rite of passage into fatherhood. I mean, a woman grows a baby in her belly and you'll hear this in the language of men. They'll say something like, um, oh, when I'm a dad and I'm like, dude, your wife's pregnant. You are a dad. <laughs> like, not when I, the due date is not when I'm a dad, like you're a father right now, that baby is living inside your, your yeah. spouse, right? So this, this mentality and guys will get in this rhythm and this routine and they, they, they know how to win. They know how to get in significance at work. They know that being at home sometimes feels difficult and challenging. They don't know what to do, especially after pregnancy, their might, wife might be experiencing postpartum depression. They're, they're, so everything is strained, right? And they just start working hard, but then that, the cycle never ends. It's one more busy season. I just got to launch this book. I just got to do this thing. I just got to hire this person. I just got to do this thing, build this website. Do, and once I get there, it'll all be great. And next thing you know, that's the same thing they say until their children are grown adults. You know, And I've seen that happen, right? It's just like that, that busy season never ends. The, the hungry ghost that you're trying to feed never goes away, right? You're just, it's just more more success, more progress, more we do, we become an entrepreneur to buy back our time. And all we do is work to buy back our time, right? right, right. The buyback never comes. Yeah. Well, dude, my son is six. I'm making the most money I've ever made as a speaker. I'm living the, sp- the dream as an entrepreneur. But my wife said something to me that was a pivotal moment. She said, you are more of a moment maker for other people than you are for your own family. Now, at this point in my life, I'm making 10, 20, even $30,000 a speech. I am just wrote a book that, you know, is very proud of, got the book out there. The book was literally called The Front Row Factor, Transform Your Art, Transform Your Life with the Art of Moment Making. And it was based on the charity that we had built. We raised millions of dollars. We helped tons of people. I was feeling a lot of significance from a dream that I had from my early 20s, but then I realized that I was a businessman who happened to have a family on the side. Hmm. And what I wanted to be was a family man 
who happened to have a business on the side. And I knew that I said family first, but there was no way that my calendar or anything reflected that truth. In right. fact, I was at a party and somebody's like, what do you do? And I naturally wanted to launch into speaking and writing and or charity, da, 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 da. But I said, I'm a, I'm a dad and I'm a husband. And then I do some other stuff. <laughs> and they're like, that's awesome. What's the other stuff, you know? And it's, but it was just, you know, like, that's how I wanted to be. Look at how people write their bios, right? It's like, accomplish this, did this, da, da, da. And then at the end, it's, oh, by the way, they happen to be married yeah. with kids and lives in whatever. Yeah. It's like an afterthought right. for, for most people. Or you talk with friends like I did, and it'd be hours of conversation and then realize that you knew nothing about their wife or their kids or their family or their personal life or their whatever. It just it was like, we, I was so good at talking about and doing business that I sucked at the other stuff. And I, I was like, I can't, my son's six. He's a third of the way to 18, a third. He's, if you get, as my friend Jim Shields says, you get 18 summers, he's six. I got 12 left, maybe. Because when he is 13, 14, that's a different life and might not want to do as much with you as they do right. when they're younger. Right. And I knew that this six to 12 window was very unique, so unique. So I decided to go all in. I, I literally let go of all speaking. I, lit, I literally don't do any speaking now, none. Hmm. Wow. I, I say no to every speech in Front Row Dads. Uh, and I'm fortunate to be able to do that because Front Row Dads is doing really well right now. And I can do that, but I started to phase myself out. And that's the reason it started, man, because it was out of desperation. I started the group I needed to join. Yeah, I mean, Juan, well, that's... I have another question on that I want to get into, but I'm going to make a thought though. I'm, it's really prioritization because anyone listening in, yes, they might not be a speaker, you know, commanding what you were getting or launching a book, but you can decide to say, you know, I'm going to leave work today at 430 and I'm going to go to my kid's soccer game. You know, it's all about priority. I was, at, it's actually funny. I was, one of the things, part of my morning routine, when I kind of just sit and think is a lot of my blog articles I write, I kind of drudge those up like they were they come to my mind and I was thinking with something that happened today with my son where he's like um sometimes I'll let him play some some games in the morning if he's at a good morning be, uh, before we go to school so I'm like uh he's like hey dad can you come up and, and see this can you check this out and I think about how I was even younger how I grew up with with my father and stuff and how I have heard other people it's kind of like a lot of times like oh, I'll come up in a little bit or I'll get it late you know it's because it's such a, in our mind, it's like, yeah, we'll do it later. It's a Monday moment. We can kind of that mundane, like just life. Yep. But what had kind of sparked in my head today and something I've been trying to prioritize the last few years with him is for him, this is the most important thing. There's, you know, kids are so present. It's like, this game is so important. He wants to show dad. So I, you know, put my coffee down. I said, all right, dude, I'll be up. And I went up and I kind of watched him. And it was kind of cool how he would, you know, with the Roblox, what he was able to do, um, which is kind of neat. But nonetheless, it was like, take away the whole, like, I'm important. I'm doing my morning routine. I got to sit here and the focus on, no, he's number one priority on the list, probably the same as your kids are. So he's going to trump anything that that happens in my life. You know, if he needs me, I'm going to be there, but it kind of got me thinking this whole idea of like, if we don't prioritize it, there's always going to be something. Again, the email pops in the phone yep. call, get whatever, you know, totally, totally. No, you're, just, you're, you're right, man. That's, that's it. I mean, that's, you know, I, I remember talking with my buddy who's a brilliant businessman and I was talking and said, he was, what do you want to do with business? And I was like, I want to grow it like this. And he said, okay, well, first of all, before we talk about growing your business, let's write out what do you want your schedule to look like? Like put on the schedule, like when do you want to hang out with your wife? When do you yeah. want to hang out with your kids? How much time is enough? Right? Like literally, I know that's a hard question to answer, but what does it look like? Now let's build a business around that. And I, so I always approached it differently in the past. It was like, well, I'm going to work Monday through Friday, of course, and probably a little more. And I'm probably going to put all my hours in the morning because that's when I'm at the best. I used to tell the family all the time, like, I'm not, I'm not available in the morning. I, 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 I'm, I'm the sole breadwinner for the family. I need to go. I used to leave at like 6.15 to go to a coffee shop just so I didn't have to deal with the family in the morning. Yeah. Really. I mean, these are the truth. These are yeah. the things people don't want to say, but it's like, this, yeah. is, this is real for me, dude. Um, and for a lot of guys, it's very real. And then 
I, re- I, you know, when I started to get more conscious around this, I was like, I don't want to put anything on the calendar on Monday or Friday. And I don't want to put anything before 10 a.m. or after 4 p.m. on the calendar. So literally, if somebody wants to book me on a podcast or I want to have somebody on a podcast, the only time that can happen is Tuesday through Thursday between 10 and 4. Mm. And Monday I work and Friday I work, but Monday is my planning day. I call that map it out Monday. I want time to to map, right? Friday is follow-up Friday. I want to close loops because what I used to have, what used to happen is I'd work till Friday at five, but I wouldn't even wind down or get out my head out of work until Saturday afternoon because mm. I needed yeah. to land the plane. Yeah. And then Sunday I'd start planning on Sunday to hit the ground running on Monday, but I would check out of the family on Sunday. So if I wasn't checked into the family until late Saturday and I was checking out on Sunday, yeah. where, where the hell did the family fit in? Yeah. Right. It was just, it was this big facade of like, lip service to being a great family man. But dude, yeah. the business has grown a lot um, over the last two years. And I've maintained this schedule 80% of the time. Now I say that because I, I don't like it when, when I think somebody's getting on a podcast and going every single day or yeah. all like I look, life takes over. I make mistakes. I make exceptions. There's, but, but truthfully, 80% of the time, that is my schedule. 80% of the time that is my schedule. And I love it, man. And I'm so much better for my family now. And yeah, um, yeah it's not I love, perfect. But no, but I, I love that. That's actually really cool. The, the whole planning, the, the mapping out Mondays, the follow-up Fridays. Because yeah, we do kind of stick in our head and we're, and we're thinking about, oh, did I do this or that? But if you know, you, hey, I'm closing the loop on it. I'll pick it up on Monday. Then you can be fully focused and, and present. And I like, by the way, you know, and I appreciate too. I know when we schedule this, I, I you know, I, I was looking at your account because generally I'll send the calendar link and I was looking at yours and I had to pick a time. Now, some people, and I know this because people have complained to me other, whether it's podcasts or other things like, you know, whatever. I'm like, I appreciate that because you know, your schedule, like this is how you work. Because again, I'm in your position. I want to get to that position where it's like, no, this is how I work. Like these are the availability times. Sure. This is how I get focused. So I really appreciate that you, have, have taken the time to recognize that's important for you personally. It may not be for other yep. people, but for you and you're sticking with it. So that's awesome. Um, I have to ask this because I'm just more curious. Your wife makes that statement to you, right? The pivotal moment. Yeah. What was your initial reaction? Fuck you. <laughs> I mean, can I curse on the show? Sorry. Yeah, sure, sure. I, I, yeah, I mean, that's really, it's like, are you serious? You're married to somebody that started a charity Right, right. Gives to people that are fighting for their life. I've built this business. I make multiple six figure income. You don't work, you know, like really that's what you got for me. Not my amazing husband, but dude, that was all ego. Yeah. And the ego is the, the thing that I've built in my life, right. To protect myself from being hurt. It's the thing that needs to defend itself. It's the thing that needs to be righteous. It's the thing that needs to like cut other people down before they cut me down. That's my ego. And my ego was hurt by that. My ego wanted, like I needed her ex, I needed an external source of approval and recognition to say, you're a good guy. And then it hit me like, I'm doing all this so other people tell me I'm okay. I'm doing this so my wife tells me I'm okay. I'm doing this so that like, I will get to the end of my life and go, I'm a good guy. See what I did? I sacrificed all those things. I wanted my kids to be like, my dad's the charity guy. My dad's the speaker guy. Like I, I, I thought all that was so important. But the thing is that, yes, all that's true. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like I want my kids to see me work hard and I want my kids to know I did good in the world. But dude, the fact of the matter is that's her experience. Like yeah. that's how she felt. I would spend more time preparing somebody's front row event at their dream concert than I would her birthday or any of my kids' birthdays. Fact, I would spend more time planning a gala to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars than I would planning our own Christmas. Fact, when I was honest with myself about it and I got over myself, right? And put my ego in check. I'm like, eh, she's right. She's yeah. totally right. Um, hard to hear. But the minute I was accepting of that fact and not defensive of it, I was able to actually change and grow. And now I'm better. Am I perfect? Hell no. Um, Am I better? Way better. Massive progress. Christmas, birthdays, special events, things for my kids. I'm definitely showing up because she had the guts to challenge me on that. 
I call that version of her the Russian assassin. So she's born and raised in Siberia. And when she like hits me dead on with that, I'm like, that's the Russian assassin. Yeah. Do you, when you go back to that though, with the ego and, and obviously, you know, you, and you, you're probably like, I'm right. What are you talking about? This is ridiculous that you're bringing this up. What was it that changed? Like, and, and I'm not going to, I won't prep you with an answer, but it, you know, was it something around the way you communicated and you guys were able to sit and talk through it? Was that you no, going away me. on your own? No, it, it, this has to be your own work. I believe now I can also give credit to my buddies because I think the best friends that you have are the ones that help you find blind spots. In fact, we just launched a quiz. This is, it sounds like a shameless plug, but I will tell you anyway, it's because we just did this called the dad quiz. And the idea was to do like, what are your blind spots as a dad? And it needs work, it's a rough draft, it's up there. But if you want to go take it, you could take it. Um, it's a little harsh, <laughs> it's the feedback we're getting, but... Uh, <laughs> It's pretty in your face. Uh, we need to soften it up a little bit. But anyway, live and learn, right? So, but he, here's the thing. My buddy, Tim, who also happens to be very direct, uh, he's the one that helped me to see that I was being really defensive around this. He didn't come to me and he didn't play the role of like, yeah, she's such a bitch. To, like, I mean, where sometimes you think that's what a good friend does. Ah, oh, she's... Yeah, she, ungrateful, whatever. He's like, how might she be right? Is there any truth of that for you? Does it hurt because it's true? Hmm. Yeah. Would you, you know, and like what's there to learn from this experience? If you're getting all worked up about it, that's probably means there's something to learn here. And thank God I've got guys in my life that won't just take my side for the sake of taking my side. I want somebody to have my back like everybody else, but I also want somebody to shoot me straight. Yeah. Nothing's like, worse than when you have food in your teeth and somebody's not telling you about it. Well, that goes back to, you know, almost the beginning of our conversation, finding the right community, Yeah, that's right? It. If you get the right people and that you can trust, respect and, and have conversations with, they're going to, they're not just there just to be, you know, the patch on the back, you know, they so, have to. Yeah. And, and listen, before we, if we do switch gears or wherever you want to take this is great. I want to say something about these blind spots though, because the more we started talking about it as a community, we, the question we were asking is, is there a pattern that we're now seeing after having worked with dads for six years, thousands of guys all over the world? Mm -hmm. What do we, what do we see? Is there a pattern with blind spots? Uh, could you sum it up? And we did, um, we landed on, there's five things and I wrote it down and I hung it up on my wall. I got the card right here. One is, is, is blind spot with time. Now, when I say blind spot, it doesn't mean that you're completely ignorant to the fact. Some guys would be like, yeah, I know I'm not home, right? Blind spot though, could mean like, you're, you're good at selling yourself intellectually, you understand it, but then you're still good at justifying. That's still a blind spot, right? Cause if you're justifying it, you've got a blind spot. Um, Time with the kids is one, just not enough time with the family. Two would be you're with the family, but you're not focused. So your head's somewhere else, right? You're checking your phone. You're thinking about your phone. You're solving problems when you're with your kids. Mm -hmm. The next one is EQ. So are you getting angry? Are you losing your temper, right? Are, are you know, how does your face look? Are you pissed? Are you shaming your kids? How could you, right? You know, that yeah. type of thing. The other one is mindset. And this one's, uh, you know, like an attitude, if you will. Um, I know a lot of guys, it's, uh, it, it's, they're feeling burnt out, right? They're just three kids under five, new business, new house, wife who's nursing herself back to health. You know, dude, it's hard to keep your head in the game sometimes, right? You're just, you feel defeated. And then the other one is around connection. So you're with your kids, your attitude might be great, but they love sports and you want to play chess or the opposite, but you're not aligning with them and your connection is off. You've got a young girl and you're a dude and you don't know what it's like to be a young girl and you don't, you know, you, your connection's off. So there, those are the blind spots. And in terms of recognizing, and maybe this is part of that quiz that y'all are trying to get at is how does someone, I guess, recognize these or yeah. work to improve them specifically? Yeah. Well, one is just being knowledgeable that like, hey, this is the thing I might want to focus in on. Dude, all these things are ones that guys could focus on. Nobody's, nobody would say, I have no room to grow in that area, right? right, right like right. everybody can grow. But so the quiz is designed to help you figure out which one's your lead domino. And then from there, we give resources to say, hey, if you're struggling with this, try this, 
right? This is an idea for you. This is what one guy did who was struggling with this. And this is the success that he had. I mean, that's the whole group is built on wins and asks. Wins are like, I had a problem. I did this. It worked. Maybe you could do the same thing. And then the ask is like, I got a problem. Here's my ask. Does anybody have a solution or an idea or a story? The whole group is built on that. A lot of communities are built on like a guru who like goes in the group every day and delivers the content to the group. That is not me. Somebody comes into the group, they're like, I barely hear from John. I'm like, right, that's with intention because you're supposed to be supporting each other. Mm -hmm. This isn't like come to John for all the wisdom and the answers. It's go to each other, community led. Like it's, you could have me pouring out my insights or ideas or whatever, or you could have four or five guys that you surround yourself with that have your back and that are constantly looking out for you. And then what about four or 500 guys to source content and information from? Yeah, that's, and I think that's important too, because going back to the blind spots, you don't know everything. One of the other community members doesn't know anything, but it's a collective group. Now you start seeing these things that, you know, maybe start Patterns getting uncovered. Important. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Um, all right, let's do that. Cause I can probably talk with you for a few hours. I'd love to, but I, I want to be sensitive from a time standpoint. Um, but let's say someone's getting started now. Let's be specific. Let's talk about maybe with fatherhood or let's talk about marriage. You could take it from however you want me, give one of each. Anything like lessons you've learned, again, maybe it's a quote you live by, maybe it's whatever um, that they could think about today to move them in the right direction forward as they prepare for these things that are upcoming. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll just tell you a question that I've been wrestling with a lot lately. And I, I feel it's a bit a good one for me. And the question is, how can you source approval, control, and security from within? This is the question I've been sitting with. And I think that a lot of us have, we all need these things, right? Approval, control, and security on some level. And likely one of them more than the other, uh, but all three of them you need. And the question becomes like, how have you been sourcing these externally? Maybe you have some awareness around that. So you might say, man, I really rely on um, people telling me I'm good enough for me to feel good enough, right? Or I really, I have this insatiable need to make more money because I just feel so insecure financially, right? It's never enough money in the bank, right? Um, or I just can't let go of something at work because I have such a need to control things and I need it to be perfect. So I never hire and delegate. A lot of entrepreneurs will face right. that one. So first you look at like, where is approval, control, and security showing up in your life and how is it affecting you? And then when you're going to approach anything, whether it be parenting or marriage or business, one of the things to figure out is how to be more resourced, how to tap into the source that lives within you. Call that God, call that universal life intelligence, call that what you will. There is an energy right? That when you're aligned with it, your core values, your mission, et cetera, when there is a knowing it within you, a confidence that brews, an unshakability, right? So somebody says, gives you an insult. If you feel it, you're prob there's probably some truth there, right? You, you feel it. If you're shaken by that, you probably aren't rooted enough, you know, yourself, and so I think that learning to um, find and source approval, control, and security from within yourself, how can you meditate in a way where when you walk out into the world, it's so noisy and so chaotic, but you can still find the stillness because it comes from within you, right? Yeah. How can you know that look, there's so many things beyond your control in the world, but how do you learn to react instead of, or respond instead of react? How do you not want to read every book that's ever been written? I remember my friend Jay Papazan saying like 15,000 new business books are published each year. There is no way that you are going to read them all, know it all. You can't have it all. You can't know it all. You can't be it all. See it all, touch it all, feel it all, experience it all. You just can't. <laughs> right. So sourcing that peace from within, right? And uh, I think that I think that's the question. That's the the mantra. That's the focus. That if we put a little time and attention to, I think we'd experience a real increase in the quality of our of our life. Yeah. Well, that's a great. Yeah, that's a great point to end on.
I mean, I think the, the whole idea of yeah, learning what we want, what makes us happy, what makes, again, to your point, what do, what do we react to? You know, what are, what are things that kind of get us a little bit hot that we could, you know, kind of understand internally so that when we come across those situations, we could react a little bit different than, uh, yeah. or respond like, I uh, like how you put that. So that's a great point. Yeah. I think sitting and again, I don't know how you do it. I, I mean, I, I journal, I do some meditation. A lot of it's just finding time to sit and just let the mind For wander, sure. you know? And because it, totally, you know, so, man. isn't it interesting how, like, when you do that, we don't like sometimes what comes into our head and what <laughs> yeah. we're thinking about, but it actually goes back to your thought earlier, the, the comment your wife made. It's like, sometimes there's truth there and we just have to accept that, Hey, this is actually real. Let's dig yeah. into it a little bit deeper and understand why it's there. You know? Yeah. Can you, that's a, that's a great first question too, is can you accept yourself? And by the way, if anything that I'm saying about approval, control, and security and accepting yourself and all this. I, I want to point you to, um, there's a guy I had on my show on the Front Row Dads podcast. His name is Jim Dethmer. And Jim runs a group called the Conscious Leadership Group. Mm -hmm. And he is a grandfather. He is wise. And um, a lot of the ideas that I'm sharing are, are not even his ideas, but he has packaged and delivered them in such a concise way that it's a great place to go learn some of these ideas that have been passed down from generation to generation. Who knows who to give credit to, you know, the first thought, uh, you know, that occurred and, and how it was delivered. But Jim's a great resource. His book is called The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. I'll put that in the, uh, the show notes as well. Um, now, this has been a, an absolute pleasure. Again, I wish I could just chat with you all day here. Go do a sauna and a coffee. At the yeah, house. man. Um, but uh, where can everyone say hello online? Where's the best place to sure. check out website? Um, for yeah, uh, I, I think that a, a place, you know, if you want to see random funny pictures of my children <laughs> and my life and the highs and the lows of it, then Instagram is probably a great place to go at John Broman, J O N B like Virginia, V-R-O-M-A-N, John Broman. Uh, I think frontrowdads.com is the hub of everything. You know, if you wanted to find out about, we've got a live event coming up in December. We have online programs available to support you. You know, uh, if you want to learn about what is the group about, the brother, we call it the brotherhood. Like if you want to learn about what that is, then yeah, I mean, we've got 300 guys from 15 different countries, the most amazing group of men. Um, it's a safe space to be yourself, to get insights and information. You know, all that's available at frontroadads.com, the podcast, all that stuff. It's all there. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that if you go to the website and you follow along, or if you just subscribe to the podcast, I mean, that might be the easiest thing to do. Subscribe to the podcast, take a listen. And at some point, you're either going to feel connected or not. And that's okay. We're not for everybody, but we're, we're definitely for somebody. Yeah. And right now we found 300 of those somebodies. And I, I imagine we're just going to keep finding more of them. Well, John, I appreciate it, man. This has been such a, a great conversation. I appreciate your insight and, and taking the time out to come on here. So thank you so much. Thanks, man. Appreciate you having me.